Right. Thank you ever so much, Tina and Martin, for opening up today. Um, according to our recent survey, um, just over half of people um, responded. So 54% um, would like to participate in clinical trials or some other kind of research, but so far haven't. Um, and a further 20% have also participated in research and 26% say they do not want to. Um, so these percentages have been very similar in our very recent 2022 survey. So to talk us through the process of uh, clinical trials, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage um, Dr. Mittal Shah, a Senior Ophthalmology Re Registrar at Oxford Eye Hospital. Um, he's also an honorary uh, clinical lecturer in ophthalmology at the University of Oxford and a research fellow at the Thames Valley and South Midlands Clinical Research Network. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So pleased to um, enjoy this first session, Dr. Shah. Thanks very much uh, for the introduction and thank you for having me here today to speak to you uh, about clinical trials. So I'm here to talk to you about the clinical trials process um, and more specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about the different phases of clinical trials. We'll talk uh, a bit about what screening and enrollment uh, of a clinical trial might involve, uh, why it's important for particularly phase three clinical trials to incorporate control. We'll talk, some, uh, talk about sort of what sorts of endpoints and measures clinical trials um, might be looking at some of the benefits and risks that you might want to consider if you're thinking about taking part in a clinical trial, and finally touch on um, some of the outcomes of clinical trials. So what is a clinical trial? Well, essentially it's a research study that uses volunteers, which, who are also called participants, and that intends to add to medical knowledge. And when you think of clinical trials, many people may think straight ahead at uh, treatment trials, but actually there are a number of different types of, of clinical trials out there. Um, so interventional trials where either a particular drug or a device is being investigated um, would fall under the umbrella of, of treatment trials. There are also observational trials where no direct treatment is being um, offered, there's no intervention involved, but participants are monitored over time. And for example, this might form part of a natural history study, which is important for us to help understand how diseases may progress over time. And finally, there's also qualitative studies, um, and these studies use interviews and questionnaires to try and find out uh, or to answer specific research questions. So I'm going to talk a bit more specifically about treatment trials um, sorry, uh, uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so these treatment trials are usually carried out in four phases. Um, phases one, two, and three tend to occur before uh, any regulatory approval, and phase four occurs after a particular drug, let's say, has been approved for use in patients. The clinical development process for drugs is both time-consuming and costly, and it can take sometimes decades and cost up to billions of dollars for a potential candidate drug to make it through to approval to be used uh, in patients. And th this process is also risky, so just over one in 10 drug candidates that enter at a phase one trial may only make it to approval and, and to be able to use them patients. So phase one trials um, aim to investigate dosage and safety of a treatment. Um, they can also be used to help try and find the correct drug dosage to use. And these experimental treatments are usually tested in small groups of participants. And depending on the um, treatment being investigated, these may be healthy people. Phase two trials aim to provide additional preliminary data on whether or not a particular treatment works in those participants uh, with a specific disease. Uh, it can also help to detect early signs of whether the treatment's working or not and what the possible side effects of that treatment might be. Again, phase two trials are also usually conducted in groups of small participants and these, can, these trials can last up to several years. Phase three trials are used to try to demonstrate a statistically significant treatment effect when compared to a standard of care in a wider patient population. 
They can be used to gather more information about how safe the treatment might be and, and its potential effectiveness, and can also be used to study um, the treatment in different populations of people and at different doses, and occasionally using a particular drug in combination with other drugs. Phase three trials use more participants than phase two trials, and depending on the treatment being investigated, this may be tens or hundreds of patients. And the key thing about phase three, three trials is that the regulatory approval, and that's approval in order for that treatment to then be used in patients, um, is usually based on the results of that phase three trial. But mo and most of the cost that's associated with drug development um, and the time spent is on these phase three trials. So why do phase three trials take so long? So there's a complex sort of uh, diagram on the right side of the screen, which um, essentially just outlines the clinical trials route map. Um, this was developed by the NIHR, or the National Institute of uh, Health and Clinical Research. But the main thing I'm using for this, or using this image for is just to illustrate how complex that process can be. So on the far left, you're starting off at the beginning of a journey, trying to plan it and uh, plan a trial and design how that trial is going to be conducted. And all the way on the right, it's at the point where the trial has been completed, you've collected the data, the data has been analyzed, results have been published, and, and, and the data are archived. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about certain points related to the trial. So for a research team who's looking to start a, a phase three clinical trial, the first step is to develop a trial protocol. And this is essentially a, a, a document that provides a full description of the intended activities of a particular trial, um, all the way from setting the study up through to collecting results, analyzing them, publishing them, and archiving the data. And it's something that's used to monitor how well the study is progressing over time and as a manual for the research team that's involved. Gaining sponsorship approval is important because it's the sponsor who takes a legal responsibility for a trial and also provides trial insurance. And usually the sponsor tends to be either a research institution, and that may be a university or commercial organization, or a hospital trust. Researchers then also need to find funding, and this is to pay for both the trial and any associated costs. And they may include things like funding salaries for research staff, funding any costs that may be associated with treatment and any, uh, any placebo, costs for laboratories, costs for statistical analysis, application fees, participant expenses, publication expenses, et cetera. You then also need to get approval from the Medicines Healthcare Products Regulation Agency, or the MHRA, and the MHRA provides a clinical trial authorization, uh, which is legally required for experimental drugs that are used in patients, or if existing treatments are used in an experimental way. And the MHRA will look at its, um, whether it's reasonably safe based on the available evidence, um, for a particular uh, uh, experimental treatment, um, and whether or not there's a plan by the researchers for detecting any potential problems that may occur, and if there's a plan in place for trying to protect those participants from any potential problems where possible. You also need health, uh, health Research Authority or HRA approval, um, and this is required when working with NHS patients, NHS data, and staff and facilities. And finally, you need NHS Research Ethics Committee approval. And the Research Ethics Committee is an independent group that comes together to try and decide whether or not the risks of any proposed treatment outweigh uh, or outweighed by the potential benefits. And also to, to make sure that the research team have, have made sure that the safety of each individual participant is greater than the outcome of the trial overall. And once you've got all those approvals, um, you obviously then need to identify sites where the research might actually be carried out. Usually, that's a process that's done in conjunction while the approvals are being gained. But at each local site, so for example, if that's an individual hospital trust, that trust will also have its own local approval processes. And the reason those are needed is to make sure that that site is able to uh, provide the resources and the capacity and capability to successfully conduct that research study, making sure, for example, the correct, um, well, one, there are enough patients within that region to be able to recruit to the, to the study, and that the appropriate bits of, um, of kit, uh, be that imaging equipment, et cetera, uh, are, that are required for the, the study are available. Only once those local approvals have been made can recruitment actually start. And it's important to point out here as well that for treatment trials, um, many of which may require more than one site to be um, 
or for more than one site to be uh, recruiting participants. Um, these may be nationwide or sometimes international. Um, and in those settings, each local site, the approval process may take different amounts of time. And sometimes depending on how many participants need to be recruited, um, it can be that additional sites will be recruited or initial site, additional sites sorry, will be taken on board once initial recruitment has started. And it's only once that final patient who's been recruited has finished the trial protocol that the final data can be collected analyzed and the results disseminated. So use, applying that sort of to a, a more real world example, so uh, Lux Turner, which was the first gene therapy for a genetic disease to be approved in the USA, their phase three pivotal clinical trial was started in November 2012. And that study recruited 31 participants at two sites in the USA with a primary endpoint at one year. And it wasn't, wasn't until almost five years, so July 2017, that the results of that phase two clinical trial were published in the Lancet. And then in December 2017, the FDA, so that's the US Food and Drug Administration, approved Luxturner for use in the US. And it wasn't until November 2018 that the EU um, approved Luxturner. So moving on to then phase four clinical trials. So these, sorts, these trials take place after the drug has been approved for use. And they're important to help monitor the drug's effectiveness and safety in a much larger and diverse patient group. And this is also because sometimes side effects from drugs may not become clear until more people have been taking that treatment over a longer period of time. So the researchers will have done all that work to try to get to the point of recruiting participants. And as a participant, um, it may be at screening or, enrol or enrollment, sorry, that um, that's the first time you may hear about a study. And at that point, it's the eligibility criteria, so it's the inclusion or exclusion criteria, which are used to determine who might be eligible for a study. And these eligibility criteria are really important um, or are an, are an important part of clinical trials to help try to de detect a treatment effect. And it's that treatment effect which is important for that treatment then to be approved uh, by the regulators. And these eligibility criteria help to define the patient population. Um, inclusion criteria specify the entry characteristics for a particular study. So that might be participant age, what the disease is, what the disease stage is. And exclusion criteria specify characteristics that disqualify a potential participant. So for example, that might be any other associated um, ocular diseases in addition to the, the disease that's being investigated. So the process of screening and enrollment um, is dependent on the individual trial design, and therefore the time that it takes will depend from study to study. Um, and sometimes it may require more than one visit, but the kinds of things that you might expect during a screening or enrollment visit um, is a vision assessment. So that could be best corrected visual acuity with a Snellen or a Logmar chart. And in some cases that may also include things like checking color vision, checking contrast sensitivity. Retinal imaging may also form part of, the, part of that uh, screening assessment. So in the top right, we've got a picture of an optical coherence tomography, an OCT image of the central retina, and that's an imaging modality that lets us look at the different la layers of the retina. And in the bottom right, we've got a blue light fundus autofluorescence image, and that type of imaging gives us information about the retinal pigment epithelium in the retina. Peripheral vision testing, so that's visual field testing, may also be required, and in some instances, electrophysiology testing may be required. So all phase three clinical trials need a control. And a control is a trial participant who doesn't receive the drug or the treatment that's being investigated, but receives standard of care or a placebo. And a placebo is a substance that has no therapeutic effect. So for example, if a trial was investigating a treatment that was given via a tablet, a placebo might be a tablet that looks, feels, and tastes exactly the same, but has no treatment effect. And the reason this is really important is because it's used to establish a cause and effect relationship with the treatment and helps to isolate the effect of the treatment. So without the control, you wouldn't necessarily be able to say that it's the treatment that's actually caused, for example, an improvement in vision, and that's where the control is helpful and needed. So going on to the endpoints or, or the measures that a trial might look at. So functional measures include things like checking visual acuity, uh, visual field testing, color vision testing, contrast sensitivity, or microperimetry. Microperimetry is a, a form of uh, visual field testing, but concentrating on the central retina um, to check function, or possibly even a mobility course to check um, fun how functional vision it changes. Objective measures may include different forms of retinal imaging, so optical coherence tomography or OCT, uh, fundus autofluorescence, retinal photography or high-resolution retinal imaging, um, and in some instances, electrophysiology. 
patient reported outcome measures may also form part of uh, a particular endpoint in a trial um, and usually these are through uh, validated questionnaires and in some instances if uh, participants or patients have been involved in the trial design, there may be some specific outcomes that that patient group has identified as being important. So that might be reading vision, um, or in some instances, things like driving vision. So as a potential participant, um, it will depend slightly on the, on the specific trial that you're thinking about, but you're going to have to consider what the be potential benefits might be as well as the risks. So some of the potential benefits of being involved in a clinical trial may be early access to a potential new treatment. And this may be a treatment that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get access to unless you were taking part in that trial. Um, for some people, it may be helpful to know that you, you're, you may be advancing knowledge within that specific field. And even for some participants, although a trial may not be able to give you a direct benefit, um, but knowing that you're potentially helping others in the future um, is beneficial. For some people, again, it may help you to play a more active role uh, within your healthcare. Some trials, depending on the trial, may involve more frequent follow-up, um, and in certain instances that may also mean more time with the clinical or research team. But uh, with all uh, trials, there are always risks to consider as well. And um, one of the risks is that the treatment may not work. Um, and some treatments may be associated with certain side effects or risks that need to be considered. And there's always the possibility that you may be allocated to the control group. Um, and finally, the time commitment um, and the potential inconvenience that, that may pose to you that could be through follow-up visits or the treatment itself. So going on to talk um, about some more sort of real-world outcomes. So the pivotal phase three clinical trial for Luxterna, which we talked about before, uh, which was the first approved ocular gene therapy, um, showed that it was able to improve functional vision in patients with RPE65 mediated inherited retinal dystrophy. Um, and that was a condition that was previously untreatable. And sort of since then, um, there's been a number of planned or ongoing treatment trials in different inherited diseases at different phases. Other gene therapy trials um, uh, are ongoing, as I said, at various phases and in various conditions, including, but not limited to, ABCA4 related retinopathy, so Stargardt disease, uh, choroideremia, um, achromatopsia, and different forms of retinitis pigmentosa, such as X-linked retinitis pigmentosa or RP related to Usher syndrome. There are also stem cell therapy trials um, ongoing in early phases, um, and again, in uh, conditions such as Stargardt disease or retinitis pigmentosa. And one example there is a study that's been conducted by JSite, uh, a pharmaceutical company, which is looking at, uh, or performed an early phase study looking at the safety and, and um, effectiveness of intravitreal treatment with human retinal progenitor cells in adult patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And finally, um, there are some early phase studies in optogenetic therapies as well. Um, so optogenetics is a technique that uses genes which encode for a light sensitive protein and introduces them um, into retinal ganglion cells. Um, and these genes enable um, sort of healthy and preserve retinal ganglion cells um, to be able to detect light. And the benefits of that particular technique are it, it's not related to the underlying genetic change um, that leads to photoreceptor degeneration. So it's important to remember that these trials are experiments and not all trials are necessarily going to meet their primary endpoints. So I'll sort of mention briefly about three examples here. So Biogen or Knight Star Therapeutics, which are again commercial companies, um, were <coughs> undertaking two studies, one called Sirius um, in X-linked retinitis pigmentosa and one called STAR in choroideremia. And these were both studies that um, failed to meet their primary endpoints. And another trial, which we'll hear a bit uh, about later on was Reneuron, which was an early phase study uh, or and also a first in human using human retinal... Pro Okay, sure, yeah, that's right. Um, so Reneuron um, was an early phase study um, and a first in human, um, looking at using human retinal progenitor cells uh, in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. So just because trials don't necessarily meet their endpoints doesn't mean that they were a waste of time. These trials will help to drive learning and innovation in things like treatment delivery. So for example, um, a few years ago, um, 
they, in Oxford, in fact, uh, Professor McLaren was the first, or performed the first surgery in a human using a robot, uh, first eye surgery in a human using a robot. And some of that work was driven by the work that he did in gene therapy. So when uh, medication is injected underneath the retina, um, you essentially need to hold a very, very small instrument, very, very still for a period of time. And stiller than a human hand is able to, because you get movements, for example, related to heartbeats. But that kind of work has led to innovation in developing um, robotics and, and, and trying to integrate that within um, eye surgery and delivery of those treatments. Um, another example in treatment delivery is um, related to, to stem cells. And while it was initially thought that the biology of actually creating new cells was going to be the difficult part, um, it's now the case of actually trying to get those cells into the eye, which is proving to be more difficult. And it, um, sort of trials will also help to innovate in outcome measures. So on the top right um, is an image um, taken with an adaptive optics scanning laser ophthalmoscope, or AOSLO. Um, and what you're able to see there is individual photoreceptors, so cone photoreceptors or light sensing, light sensing cells at the back of a living human eye. Um, and potentially more sensitive um, uh, imaging modalities or outcome measures may also be useful um, in studies in the future. And finally, where approaches haven't worked, um, not only will it lead to innovation in trying to work out what went wrong, but also it helps to point researchers if there's a particular approach that doesn't work, um, sort of moving their energy and focus into uh, looking at different ways uh, to, to conduct uh, clinical trials. So uh, that's everything I had to cover uh, as part of my presentation. Uh, and I also just wanted to thank the Eye Research Group uh, Oxford, who's a clinical research group at the Oxford Eye Hospital led by Professor Susan Downs, but there'll be time later on for any specific questions as well. Thank you. Um, Nitel, thank you very, very much for that really great overview and whiz through the clinical trials process. Um, Ms. Hull is going to stay um, with me on the platform. My name is Kate Arkell. I'm the Research Development Manager at Retina UK. And I'm also very pleased to invite up to join me um, Matthias Segovia, who is a research nurse at Oxford uh, Eye Hospital, and also David Bureau, who has taken part in a clinical trial and is living with RP. So um, if you'd both like to uh, come and join me now and take a seat, and we're just going to have a... Um, so we're just going to have um, a bit of a chat about the clinical trials process and what it's really like to take part because um, I really wanted everybody um, listening today to get a feel for life at the coalface of a clinical trial um, and especially of course what it's like to take part. Um, Clinical trials and progress in research simply can't happen without the involvement of those living with inherited sight loss. Um, and there may be some of you in the audience today who are potentially part of the future of research. So David, firstly, tell us which trial you were involved in. So I was on that phase two, I think, the phase two, uh, phase two renew on uh, stem cell research. So I had stem cells put in the back of my eyes, in my retina. I'm, I'm actually looking at Mittal there to uh, confirm that was the... Yeah, I was going to say, Mittal, can <laughs> you just briefly tell us a little bit more about the rationale behind the Renewron trial and, and what the treatment was? Uh, so the Renewron trial was um, an earlier phase study uh, looking at injecting human retinal progenitor cells um, essentially underneath the retina. And the idea there being um, in conditions um, where the retinal pigment epithelium um, so the best way I like to describe that, if you think of like an old-style camera, where you've got the lens at the front and the film at the back, retinal pigment epithelium is a bit like, if you remember in the old cameras, there's a bit of black cloth just behind where the film sits. So if the film is like the retina, the black cloth is like the retinal pigment epithelium. And in the eye, that retinal pigment epithelium is a really important part of keeping the overlying retina healthy and working. Um, and in conditions where you have um, damage or where the retinal pigment epithelium has died away, the overlying retina is going to degenerate over time. So the idea of the study was by injecting um, these stem cells um, underneath the retina, the idea was trying to see if you could get that retinal pigment epithelium um, to stop degenerating. 
David, had you imagined one day taking part in a clinical trial, or was it something you just dismissed as unlikely? Yeah, no, I, I um, always wanted to. I, you know, I didn't think it, it was it was actually going to happen. Um, uh, I was always up for doing it. You know, not ne not necessarily for my life improvement, but but, but to help for the uh, future um, <laughs> treatment and research of people. Then how did you first find out about the possibility of taking part in this trial? So I was phoned by Anna um, from, from Oxford Eye, Eye Hospital. Uh, she phoned me up and, and asked and explained what the treatment was, explained that I had been identified as someone who, 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 who could possibly um, actually take part in, in our trial. Um, and she asked if I was willing to actually do it. Do you know, or perhaps Matthias can explain, how Anna would have identified David, yes. um, yeah, because I'm, I'm quite interested to know, and I think people are interested to know, how easy it is to recruit for trials, and are you perhaps overwhelmed with participants, or do you struggle to find participants? So it really depends on the study. Um, some studies are for very rare genetic conditions, um, so the pool of participants available and willing to take part is very small, um, but we usually um, see patients in clinic, they express their interest in research um, and we put them down in our uh, site register. So when we have a new trial coming on, um, we go through that site register and we actually contact all the patients that might be suitable to take part. Okay. So if people listening today are very keen to take part in a future trial, what's the best way for them to put themselves on the radar, sure. as it were. So the best way, I would say, is speak with your ophthalmologist, uh, express your interest in research, and say that you would like uh, to take part in any trials available in your sites. Um, you can always contact us. We are the Eye Research Group Oxford. The, we have a website in which you can express your interest. You can see all the trials that we're running. And we are always more than happy to be contacted and discussed. But yes, uh, I think it's easier and more convenient for you to um, be part of trials closer to your mm. house. Yeah, and Oxford obviously isn't the only centre at which trials run. Um, it will just depend on the trial. So, but just quickly, can people register their interest with you even if they're not an Oxford patient? Definitely, okay. yes. So that probably applies to other centres as well, but do speak to your ophthalmologist. Um, David, what were your first thoughts when you were initially approached? I was actually quite quite excited uh, about doing it. I I actually joked I was um order, I was ordering a new car, uh, thinking that it would it would solve all our problems. Um, but um I yeah I I was just really keen to kind of be 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 involved. Um, you know my eyesight, uh, my right eye is not great. So I was explained about the risks and all the benefit and and the potential benefits, um, but I was just keen to kind of be involved. So what was the next step in the process after you first had that initial contact from Anna? So the next step was to um, I had to do a lot of screening tests, um, as Mitchell explained. Um, I think there was like three or four full days of screening. And it was just repeating the tests over certain days, just just to kind of make sure that I did meet all, all of the criteria. Okay. Did that surprise you? That length of, of time that that screening took. Um, I was actually warned that that it would it would it would take it would it would actually take that amount of time. So I was you know I had, I'd had all the information from Oxford. I was I was pre warned about what what would be needed, how much time I would I would need off work. Uh, I was quite kind of prepared for it. I was just going to ask you, Matthias, there, there is quite a lot involved in screening. How do you manage that for patients? How do you, can you do anything to try and make that process yeah. a bit easier? So, um, there's a lot of planning behind on all, on all of these visits. Uh, as Michal was explaining, actually, the study protocol states uh, all the little things that we need to do on each visit. So we have pretty clear instructions and how to follow them. Um, so we need to ad adhere to those instructions, so we plan minute by minute what we're going to do on the day. Of course, there's always delays, um, but we try to um, stick to our plans. 
um, there's a lot of assessments that need to be carried out just to make sure that the patient being assessed is the right one for that trial. Um, so um, the trial can um, recruit more participants and meet their endpoints, so to speak. Yeah. Did you have lots of questions before you get So I had, I had lots of information. Um, it, it was a constant frustration from Anna's team uh, that I didn't really ask many questions, to be honest. <laughs> all, the, all the information was given to me. Uh, we did some research online about what the company was, what the process was. Mm -hmm. So I was quite com comfortable with. Um, yeah. yeah. Matthias, like? have you got any tips for people on how to approach the participant information? Because they're given quite a lot of information, aren't they, at the start of? It's quite daunting sometimes. There are a lot of pages uh, with a lot of information. Um, so what we always tell uh, our possible candidates is to go through it calmly, with time, take your time to read it, um, mark it, write on it, uh, discuss it with friends, with relatives, uh, to have different points of view. So um, it's not only your own worrying and uh, own thoughts, you can always find other uh, points of views in other people. Um, and yes, always contact us. Uh, we're always available to answer questions. If we don't know the answers, we are more than comfortable to tell you. We'll come back to you later. But yes, take your own time and we will never pressure you to give us an answer. Yeah. I was going to say, do you mind how long people take? No, I mean, obviously not. within reason. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, please do not take three or four months. That's, I mean, if you have to, that's fine. Um, and if there is a time constraint, uh, if the recruitment of the study is going to end soon, we're definitely going to let you know so you know that um, you have to take your time, but not too much. Okay. David, how long after that lengthy screening process was it before you found out that you were definitely going to be enrolled? Can you I remember? Th I think it was quite, it was actually pretty fast, I think. I think after, after the, the last one, um, I think I was like booked in like a month later. It, okay. it, it, it was like super fast to kind of, uh, okay. to kind of do it. Actually, Matthias, just to go back to screening, um, an important question I missed was to say, do you always need to know somebody's genetic diagnosis in inherited retinal conditions before you enroll them in a trial? Yes. So before uh, the screening visit, sometimes it is required and sometimes it is not. It depends on what the protocol states. Um, for example, in Davis case, um, uh, it was not required because we could do a genetic test on the screening visit. Saying that, um, genetic tests usually take a long time uh, for us to get the results, so it might be a longer period uh, of screening, but still depends on the study. Yeah, okay. So that's just another reminder to bear genetic testing in mind. And um, if you want more information on that, you can uh, visit Unlock Genetics, uh, our information resource, and there's some information about that next door. Um, how often do you have to turn people away after screening? Oh, well, um, so we are very strict with our pre-screening pre process, sorry. Um, so we uh, looked at all the information that we have from previous clinic visits from the patients okay. to make sure that we're not putting the patients okay. in a long screening process yeah. without the need to, if we know that they're not going to be eligible. So we look at images that doctors took in the past. Um, we looked at uh, your vision levels um, in previous visits, just to make sure that you fit the criteria. But, <clears throat> excuse me, there's... I cannot tell you a percentage, no. but there's always some people that get turned away from unexpected reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, David, coming back to you, it was only about a month before mm -hmm. you were booked in, but did you know ahead of time, generally, how much time the trial was going to require? Did you have to plan ahead to book time off work? I, and yeah, I was warned, I was warned about how, how much time would, would, would be needed, so, so there, I was pre-warned about all the screening tests and then I then had to take um, one or two days off to get a baseline um, reading for from, from my eyes, and then I knew the operation was a week or a week to recover. Mm -hmm. 
and then there would be periodic days where I would need to go. So I, I had my six months um, from when I was going to start the trial all planned out. Is that typical, Matthias, that, that kind of level of commitment yeah. and planning? Yes, uh, so every clinical trial, um, it's a big commitment to take on. Um, most of all, if it's, for example, this one, a surgical trial, um, there, are, there are a lot of follow-ups just to make sure that uh, we uh, keep safety on, on our mind, keeping safety on our mind. Um, yeah, it's very usual uh, to have a lot of visits after the, the surgical procedure and then they're spreading out a bit more for one year or two years. Okay, so that's quite a long-term commitment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, David, tell us about your experience of the surgery then when you went in for the treatment and the immediate aftermath of that. Yeah, so I was, I was, um, I'd, I'd be pre-warned about all, all of the process. I was, I was, because I was going to be the first person in, in, in the UK to have this study, uh, the BBC came and filmed and I was asked if, if, if I was willing to be interviewed by Fergus Walls and, and, and have the operation filmed, which I was. Um, so the whole day uh, was actually just, just a blur because as soon as I got in, uh, we did some more tests. Um, I was prepped for surgery. I was interviewed. There was all the film crew and camera crew. I had to kind of fake walking down, walking down the corridor <laughs> towards, towards the operating uh, theater. Um, and then I had the operation, you know, it was all quite smooth, all quite, all quite easy. Um, and then I just went home home that evening after the anaesthetic had worn off and yeah I kind of had a week of lying on my on my front uh, while the air pocket uh, air bubble kind of was that, went away. Was that tough, to it think. was quite hard um, I've got some images um, my wife has taken some nice photos of, of me um, lying with my head on the footstool on the sofa and my body on the sofa and reading my iPad on the on the on the floor which isn't the most appealing so I don't think. <laughs> um, Matthias, is it okay? Would it have been okay for David to change his mind at the very last minute? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> we're um, very, very. Um, I cannot get the word right. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, we're very happy. So you're offering your time. Uh, you're offering yourself uh, to clinical research. So you're more than uh, welcome to say no at any point. And were the team at Oxford in touch with you regularly oh, when you were lying with your head looking yeah. down at your iPad? I was getting also? I was getting text messages. I was getting uh, I was being yeah, and emails, getting kind of checks all the time. And as and as uh, Matthias mentioned, so after after the operation, I had to I had to go in four times within a two week period just to get those checks and balances and okay. make sure everything was okay. So I was in capable hands. Okay, so that's all part of your safety monitoring. Um, presumably, um, and can people call you anytime yes. in that? We provide telephone numbers, uh, if they need to text us, we're happy as well. Emails, we check them constantly, we provide uh, also telephone numbers uh, for out of hours issues, so yeah. So generally, I mean, Mittel mentioned in his talk all of the measures and, and things, how often do you um, do that sort of battery of tests? So it depends on the visit. Um, uh, usually the most heavy one are the screening and baseline visits, okay. if it's an interventional study. Um, and then uh, after the surgery, uh, we just monitor safety after the procedure, so we don't do a lot of tests. But then every so often we have to perform everything so the sponsor or whoever is doing the study can assess um, how the patient's doing. So David, what happened with your vision after this surgery? So after the, surg the surgery, I, um, uh, nothing really happened to me. <laughs> it was, it was all, a bit, um, all a bit sad. Um, no, it was, uh, so nothing really kind of significantly happened. There was not this great groundbreaking, <laughs> wow, I can see again. Um, but I did notice a few months after the surgery that I could see some light out of the side of my eye, my eye, which I didn't think I could see pre previously, and 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 actually when I turned around, I couldn't see it out, out of my left eye. So I had my operation on my right eye, okay. um, 
and I can still see a bit of light, which I can't see on my left side. Okay. But, but apart from that, all my, all my normal vision kind of returned to normal after, after the airport had went. Okay. And you, presumably, the Oxford team were telling you from their point of view what they were seeing on the, on the measurements. Yeah. What, what did well, what happen there? Well, there wasn't. There wasn't again. There wasn't a groundbreaking improvement. Um, I think. Uh, I think about uh, two or three months after, after the operation and after all the tests, then the actual trial was stopped because there were some issues in terms of, in terms of the safety. Uh, so so they stopped the trial. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. My car's uh, my car's been cancelled. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I mean, how, how did that feel? Did you feel um, a sense of disappointment? I was, yeah, I was. If, if it was, I think I, I think in in my mind, you build up that this is going to solve solve everything, um, and it kind of didn't. <laughs> um, Miss Hull, can you briefly explain what ultimately happened with this particular trial? Yeah. So, as David mentioned, the trial ended up being stopped early uh, because of complications mainly that were related to the surgical procedure, trying to get the cells underneath the retina. Um, so the company, because it was an early phase study, and as I mentioned before, so the early phase study is also they're partly looking at how well it's working, they're also looking at safety. Um, and so when they were checking, um, because it appeared that there, was, there were more sort of surgical complications happening, the sponsor, which was a company, decided to stop uh, the, the study early. Is there any future for that treatment? I mean, were there any positive outcomes from that trial? I think the sort of notice that the company sent afterwards, um, the lower dose of the cells didn't appear to have the same safety issues, but potentially wasn't working as effectively as, effectively as the higher dose. So for that specific bit, not so much, but there are other stem cell related trials ongoing from other companies using different approaches. Okay, and presumably just that sort of scientific learning is recorded somewhere yeah. and it's not, yeah. Um, David, what would your advice be to somebody out there today who has, might have, be given the opportunity yeah. in the future to take part? I would actually grab it. I would grab it with both hands. You know, this, this, I, this eye disease is not a nice one. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. It's, um, what's the worst that, that can happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, I, you know, that's my view in life in that. You know, it can't really get that much worse, so I would just do it. Would, I would, just you, do it. would you go through it again yeah. if you could? Yeah. Um, Mittel, does um, taking part in a trial, one trial, exclude you from taking part in another one in the future or for a particular length of time? Um, so overall, no, um, but it will very much depend on what trial you were part of and what trial you're looking to be part of. So, for example, if it was an interventional trial uh, where you've had an operation um, and the follow-up trial is, let's say, qualitative research, so trying to find out your experiences and how you have feel that the, the experience of the trial was or how your vision is afterwards, then no. Um, but if the next trial is another interventional trial, um, then potentially it may do. And each trial will have their specific inclusion-exclusion criteria. And if it's part of the new trial, it says you, you're not to have had surgery before or had surgery within a specific amount of time, then depending on when you had it previously, it may exclude you. Okay. Um, all three of you, thank you so much um, for your contributions. I think that's given us a really great insight into real life clinical trials. Um, we'll be moving on to our main um, research Q&A session in just a moment, um, for which um, Ms. Hal and Matthias um, will be staying on the platform with me. Um, but before that, are there any questions specifically for David about his experiences? One at the back and one in the it's middle. Um, thank you very much for your experiences. Um, just wanted to ask you, do you think, um, personally for myself, I've got RP ush 2 a they're not doing trials at the moment, I think this is for the whole panel, but for David in particular, did you feel that this is it, because like, hearing your story was quite inspirational, and thinking, yes, you know, this disease is going to go away, like, you know, getting that car and getting back to some kind of normality, whatever that is in these days. But did you feel crushed at any point while the trials were going? Because if someone's embarking on what you've gone through and they're not successful, 
what advice would you give them if they were absolutely devastated that they didn't pass the initial screening? Yeah, I didn't feel crushed. I, I didn't feel crushed. I think, you know, we've, you know, you know, we've got used to living this life. Um, so anything I thought would, that could help improve or make things better, uh, you know, is worth a shot. Um, if it didn't improve it, then nothing has really changed. You know, we just carry on with, with, with how we live our lives. So I wasn't, I wasn't kind of, you know, going to be crushed. I wasn't expecting, you know, I, even though I joke about the car, I, I knew it wasn't going to change overnight. And it's not necessarily about me and my life. It's more about um, all, all the future. I think that was, you know, that's my outlook on life. I haven't lost hope yet. Hopefully, you know, there will be a cure for this horrible disease for all forms of RIDs. And hopefully they'll find one for every single one on that spectrum of the different X-linked, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, not to lose hope. I mean, that's one thing I don't want to lose is hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, is this working? <clears throat> okay, so I might regret asking this question, but um, you mentioned you have RP, and um, from my understanding of RP, um, it's a progressive disease, and um, it can, I've been told it can affect people slightly differently. So I'm just curious if you don't mind sharing what your kind of situation with RP is and how it affects your vision. Yeah, I've got uh, my forward vision on my left eye is pretty good. So I can read like down to four from the bottom on on um, on the eye chart. Um, but I've got I've got nine percent, nine degrees of vision, I think. Um, so I, I haven't really got any any kind of um, any vision um, on either eyes from my side. Uh, my right eye's always been a, a weak eye, even even when I was a child. So um, I've always had like milk, milk bottle lenses uh, on my on my right eye. So all the trial that I was that I was actually done was just on one eye on, on my right eye, um, and it was only to try and see the effect of the peripheral vision. It wasn't going to change any any any, any of my forward um, my forward sight, the central sight. Yeah, I have one more question, if that's all right. And um, I'd like to learn, know a little bit more about. Um, post um, your operation, uh, you mentioned something about having like bubble in your eye and then having to lie flat on the floor. I'd like to know a li little bit more about why that was and how it affected your vision. As part of the as part of the operation, they had to detach my retina, and so the process for reattaching the retina is to put an air an air bubble. I think that's what it's called, is it? An air bubble to kind of push the retina back to kind of make sure it reattaches. So. For the first week, um, you've got to lie on your front to kind of help help that air bubble um, actually dissolve. Um, but when you do stand up, it looks as though, as though you're looking underwater. Um, there is, have we, have we run, okay. I think that's probably all we've got time for. Um, but if you do still have a question that you'd like to ask, um, do feel free to have a chat with David's here until lunch yeah. time, I think. So um, do catch him in the break if you want to have um, a further chat. David, thank you so thank you. much for joining us and sharing your experiences. Um, we are going to move to our main uh, research question and answer session um, where you can, of course, um, ask uh, Mittal and Matthias any more questions you have about clinical trials, um, but we're also open to any other research-related questions. And I will uh, also be welcoming to the platform uh, two of our trustees, um, Elizabeth Graham, who is a, a retired consultant ophthalmologist with a particular interest in um, uh, inflammation and the relationship between the eye and the brain, and Simon Keatley, who's a retired consultant ophthalmic surgeon. And we're also going to be joined online by another of our trustees, Professor John Marshall, um, who's conducted wide-ranging eye research over the course of his career. Um, if you could just give us a couple of minutes while we do some stage adjusting and uh, microphone logistics, that would be wonderful.
everybody for bearing um, with us. Um, so we're now joined on the screen by uh, John Marshall. So um, Liz, uh, Simon and John, would you just each like to briefly introduce yourself, say a little bit more about yourselves. Hello, I'm Liz Graham. I'm a retired consultant ophthalmologist, primarily from St Thomas's in London. And I also worked at the National Hospital for Queen Square and Great Ormond Street, because my primary interest is inflammation of the eye and also of the brain. So the main thing I did was look after patients who had something wrong with their eyes, which reflected something that was wrong with their body. So the treatment of it was often drugs as well as surgery, as opposed to just surgery. Um, and I've had a, quite a lot to do with clinical trials in my time, not primarily of retinal degeneration, but of how the inflammation affects the retina. And I retired first in 2014, and then I worked, went back to Great Ormond Street and worked for another three years. Hi, hello everybody. I'm Simon Keatley. Um, I am nothing like as eminent as my two colleagues, John and Liz. Um, I'm very much a jobbing ophthalmologist. I uh, worked in a district general hospital in Basingstoke um, for the past 40 years, uh, and I retired about three years ago. So I really am... Uh, probably what you lot may see every time you go to a clinic. It's a, it's a, a busy outpatients clinic. Um, and uh, ophthalmology uh, is, is, is getting increasingly busy, really. So I was doing uh, cataract surgery, uh, dealing a, a, a little bit with retinal, inherited retinal diseases. But of course, as you, as you know, these are quite rare. So we didn't see that many. Um, I've done a few clinical trials, mainly in um, um, uh, driving, in fact. I was quite interested in uh, 
uh, up the eye and driving. Uh, so uh, I was on the, uh, uh, the government uh, um, advisory panel on, on vision and driving. Uh, and since I've retired, um, I still keep my brain going a little bit by uh, doing some examining for um, trainee eye doctors, uh, which is actually very interesting, uh, and uh, composing questions. And since I've been a trustee of uh, RET in the UK, I've actually learned quite a lot uh, and actually produced quite a few uh, questions on retinal, well, uh, inherited retinal diseases, which is really, really important, I think, to train these young uh, eye doctors. Uh, to know a little bit about this uh, very rare, uh, these rare diseases. So that's me. Thank you very much both you and John. I'm looking at the screen, I don't know actually where John is looking, but uh, John would you just quickly like to uh, give us a quick introduction? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm John Marshall. I guess I was there right from the very beginning of the foundation of what was the British Retinitis Pigmentosa Society and have seen its uh, development over the uh, years. Um, people think I'm the Heinz Professor of Ophthalmology, 57 varieties. They're never quite sure what I'm working on. Um, I invented the laser treatment for short-sightedness and long-sightedness that you see all the publicity um, on. <clears throat> I'm currently back at the Institute of Ophthalmology, um, but I have a profound interest in genetic eye disease and again co-founded a, a company in San Francisco which originally was going to um, concentrate on detecting very rare conditions at the front of the eye but then COVID intervened and having PCR and lateral flow and all the techniques we required, we immediately switched to COVID screening, which produced a lot of money, which we found available for working on gene therapy. And at the front of the eye, it, we are now in the process of applying for permission to do a trial of gene therapy using drops. So this will be gene therapy without surgery and it isn't going to affect the gene itself but it's going to interfere with the signal between a defective gene and the manufacturing processes in the cell. So by switching off that message we will effectively treat the disease and in early uh, stages of uh, experimentation in lots of animals that have similar conditions we've been very successful in being able to switch off a defective gene so this is particularly relevant for autosomal dominant diseases the ones that occur in families generation to generation regardless of sex so i guess over the last 50 years I've had a very interesting time. I, I really call it around the globe in 50 years, but it's around the globe of the eye as well as the, around the globe of the earth. Thank you very much, John. So um, can we uh, move over to you guys and everybody at home to uh, submit their questions? So if you're in the room, do stick your hand up and somebody will bring you a microphone. If you're at home, please use the question and answer box in Zoom. So we've got a couple of the back and also a lady here. Um, hi, my name's Sarah. Um, I was told when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed from a small, well, from a baby, really. I've actually got retinitis pigmentosus, labors amaurosis, optic atrophy, Usher's type two. Try saying that when you're drunk. <laughs> Um, I actually, I actually lost my sight due to the um, optic atrophy. I can see light, dark, and shadows, but I've got no idea whatsoever what the shadow is. Um, is there any genetic research that can actually help? And I was told it was one in ten million to have all three together. The eye hospital in Birmingham hasn't even got any information on all three together. So okay, I was just asking so the professor, because he seems to be the one who... <laughs> I mean, Mittal, have you ever come across that combination of 
you know, multiple um, underlying genetic conditions at all? Not, not like that. Um, so, I mean, I know in some people with quite severe end-stage degeneration, um, that can sort of appear, affect the appearance of the nerve at the back of the eye, but uh, not in that sort of way with three separate um, things going on at the same time. Um, should we put that to John? Um, you were saying that it was the optic atrophy that you've been told is actually responsible. Well, I, I guess Liz would also have some comments on this, but in reality, in, in many years ago, there was a lot of miss or confused diagnosis of various inherited retinal dystrophies. And it's only really with the advent of genetic screening that we can be absolutely specific to say you have got the following problems. So I'm not sure whether your original diagnosis was an accurate diagnosis, but the fact that you have had uh, problems with the optic nerve is probably the, the um, causal element that's caused your vision to go so dramatically. But Liz is the real expert on the eye and the brain. Um, what it is as well, um, my optic nerve's completely atrophied, but the RP diagnosis was retinal atrophy. Um, I was diagnosed from birth, but I didn't actually lose my sight to the level it is now till I was in my late 30s. Um, it got to the point where I couldn't see faces on the TVs. It was all like a blurry screen. Um, and I'm in constant pain with my back of my head. And I've also um, developed um, Charles Bonnet syndrome because I can't, my brain's trying to see something it can't. So that keeps me awake 24 seven. I think I get about eight hours sleep a week because I've constant, when I'm trying to, go to sleep it's content like a white fog yes. the, the room is white and the, and 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 then i've got like the vertical blind and the black shadows and the flashing lights whether my eyes are awake or closed i can't get rid of it Liz, do you want to say something about child one syndrome as that's come up have you got any comments on um that? Do people in the room understand the word of Charles Bonnet, which is a syndrome that's associated with very poor vision of any cause? So it can be due to people who have very poor optic nerve function or people with very severe macular function. And basically it happens because the brain and the area of the brain that normally sees when all the pathways are working is still trying to work but it doesn't have the engineering to do that because the optic nerve isn't working. And consequently, it sort of goes into overdrive and shows people lots of different forms. They're usually colored and they can be very vivid. They can be people in funny clothes, they can be horses, or they can be ghastly zigzags like you're describing. And it's very, very debilitating. It's just awful and it is, unfortunately very difficult to treat. Normally with time, things ameliorate and do get better. And there are a few specialists in the country who deal with it a lot. And I'm sure you've probably seen one or two of them. Never. Never. Well, there are, your local ophthalmologist would know people and there are, so there, there is, I think there's an association, isn't there, for Charles Bonnet, um, which Esme's, can be quite helpful. You, you, next door. Um, um, they are, it's Esme's umbrella, um, they are with us today. And also, uh, for any of you who are interested in this or experiencing it, we do have a webinar uh, available on our website, which is uh, an, an hour of, of talking about Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, Dominic Fitch um, did that for us, and he's a leading expert. So uh, have a look at that if you would like to. Um, we've got some a question the back from the online uh, participants. Um, so this was a, a question by email. Uh, my 20 year old daughter with RP has been refused a provisional driving license because her provisional vision is borderline on the test required by the DVLA. Is there anything that can be done to improve peripheral vision? 
Simon, do you want to... Thank you. Um, yes, this is always a, an issue. Um, and retinitis pigmentosa obviously um, reduces your peripheral um, vision. Uh, and David described that really rather well um, to you um, already. Um, but gradually it can just um, move in. So you're looking through, effectively looking through a, a small tunnel. Um, the DVLA, the Driving Licence Authority, um, have specific um, regulations for driving, um, quite rightly in my view. Um, and uh, that really stipulates that with both eyes open, you have to have about 120 degrees on the, well not about, an exact, exactly 120 degrees on the horizontal, which is about that, um, which, is a, which is slightly, um, uh, slightly less than one eye. So you can drive a car with one, one normal eye, um, but if you don't have um, 120 degrees on the horizontal, then that debars you from a provisional and a full license. Um, in addition, you can't have any significant spots in your central vision for driving. Uh, so if you've got little, uh, little areas of blind, blind spots in the middle, uh, within 20 degrees, then that also debars you, sadly. Um, and it is very frustrating for people with retinitis pigmentosa, which often starts relatively mildly. Um, and uh, youngsters, you know, don't, sometimes don't know they've got a problem apart from difficulty in the dark, for instance. Um, but often their visual fields are sadly not enough to drive. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sorry, I didn't quite understand what Matt was <laughs> trying to say to me there. Clearly, Matt and I need to do some sign language training before. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Uh, you mentioned before about uh, stem cell therapies. Um, so where do they come from? Are they from the patient themselves or are they from a third party? Uh, Miss Al, can you explain a little bit more about the retinal progenitor cells? And yeah, so I'll just talk about stem cells in general um, rather than specific trials because different trials will potentially get them from different places. Um, but I suppose in an umbrella way of looking at it, there's three sort of sources. One is embryonic stem cells, what's called embryonic stem cells, and they come from a blastocyst. So that's sort of, um, <coughs> sort of a, a group of sort of five cells, and when you take one of those, they are immortal, so they will kind of keep producing um, more cells. You can get what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. So that's where you would take, for example, a skin cell from an adult, uh, let's say my skin cell, um, you do certain things in the lab, you take it back to a, uh, essentially, again, a pluripotent stem cell, which is um, a cell that can turn into anything and live forever. And then from there, you then go forward to create it into whatever it is that you uh, want to create it into. And the final one is what we call adult stem cells. So you may have heard of it, things like in bone marrow, there are certain stale cells within sort of fat or adipose tissue. Um, so these are cells that are sort of there from when you were a baby that still have that ability to, to to keep producing sort of other cells and um, in certain studies, some people in the past I think have looked at sort of transplanting those across as well. So I think um, the cells that have been, are in clinical trial already and the cells are proprietary preparations of cells that have been grown up. We don't and, um, necessarily know the details, but they are sort of commercially developed cell lines um, that have been, that are cultured and developed. I don't know if, Either of you know any, anybody knows any more about that? But John, do you know? Yeah, hi. <laughs> Basically, um, there is a bit of a misconception with stem cells in that current treatment regimes have rather concentrated on the pigment epithelium. Now, the pigment epithelium is the layer behind the retina, and that is a label, a layer that is capable of cell division. So those cells can actually replace themselves in situ. And the reason they don't normally is because they are so locked together. It's called contact inhibition. But if you release them from contact inhibition, those cells are capable of dividing and recoating an area. The area of most interest is unfortunately the area of less research. And that is the area of light sensitive cells, because those are cells which are formed 
early in embryogenesis, but cannot divide like most of the nervous system. And those are the cells whose loss deprives our patients of vision. Uh, it is quite difficult to, first of all, produce those cells in a viable form, and secondly, to get them in the eye and then to connect up in the ways that they should. So that is an interesting area for stem cell research, which unfortunately at the moment isn't moving as quickly as we would like. There's some great work going on in France, but it's not moving as quickly as, as the rest of us would like. The other issue here is that in a retinal degeneration, the rod cells tend to die completely if they're insulted. And the rods, strangely enough, are the specialist cells. They are late developments in evolution. The cone cells are very primitive cells. And when you harm a cone cell, it loses its light sensitive portions, so you can't see. But the rest of the cell and all its connections are still there. So there's another school of thought, again initiated in France, but now very powerful in the US, where people are trying to activate so-called clock genes to switch on manufacturing of the bits that go missing. So if you've got a cone cell there that can't see anything because it's lost its light sensitive portion, the idea is, well, during embryogenesis, it grew one of those. So if we can activate those genes that were active way back then, it can grow another one. And there are some quite interesting results in uh, so far in animal um, studies. So it's not true stem cells, but it's a better understanding of the cell biology and a faster push towards potential therapeutic intervention. Thank you very much, John. Um, we've got one more question. And then I think we'll be, oh, a couple more, and then we'll be uh, running out of time. So. I'm, I'm Di Diane, I've got classic RP. I've, I've still got my central vision. It's, it's, uh, my peripheral vision is going very slowly. My question is actually quite a general one based on the, the last session. Um, Kate, you said there are lots of different research organisations in the country. The general question is, how joined up are you? The, the specific question is, I'm on Moorfield's list for research. Do I then, do I have to apply to all these different organisations to get on their lists? Yes, Matthias, do you want to comment on that? So you wouldn't, for example, be able to see details at Moorfield's if you had a clinical trial underway at Oxford that didn't involve Moorfield's, you would be unable to see. Sadly, uh, there's no... Um a made connection between different research organizations. So if you would like to uh, be part of a study that's being carried out in another site of our from Moorfields, so we need to get in touch with the team and we'll definitely come back to you. But I think the consultant ophthalmologists who do research in a particular subject are very joined up. So that if they're starting a trial and they're looking for patients, they will speak to all their colleagues who deal with that sort of disease and say, what we're looking for is RP with a certain field defect, a certain age, a certain sex, etc. And this is what we need to really test this new treatment. And so they, they are joined up from that point of view. And they're only, they want as many appropriate patients because one of the secrets of clinical trials is having a very pure entrance criteria in the way of group of patients. So you know exactly what you're studying and you don't muddy the waters with people who don't quite fulfill the criteria. So the ophthalmologists are very joined up. Thank you, Liz. That's, I think that's a really good point to make. Um, at the back there. Oh, and actually there's a, okay. Sorry, I think somebody's got a <coughs> No, Simon, I think behind you, and there's a lady. Hi, Hi I've got one from online, if I may. Okay. Um, I have two defective genes, USH2A and RPGR. My consultant has advised me that my retinas are too thin for the current treatment trial for USH2A. My wife read an article on RP research 
and potential treatment page on social media about a month ago, whereby mini retinas were grown in a Petri dish and that this procedure made it easier for stem cells to reproduce into photoreceptor cells. I have not been able to find this information on this page since. As I and many others in the community have light perception or less, this research, research sorry, could be of benefit. Could you advise whether this information is true? And if so, would it restore central vision? Thank you. Um, John, I think, yes. <laughs> well, two, two things. I, I'd also like to sort of follow on from the last question, and that is that uh, Retina UK has organized an integrated team of research workers of um, those carrying out um, genetic studies and trials, etc. So Retina UK has also made a major contribution to interaction between groups. Um, in relation to this specific question, yes, these things are called retinoids, and uh, this started in Japan. And uh, strangely enough, you can grow um models of the retina because it, in in the retinoids you you have a three-dimensional structure as opposed to conventional tissue culture in which the cells are just flat on the base of a petri dish so these retinoids enable you not only to look at differentiation of one set of cells but a whole group of cells and how they make their connections um, i have to say that covid interfered with some of the research work going on at uh, University College London where a number of these were lost because of restricted access to the buildings. But this is an extremely impressive area of research and one that's moving very, very quickly. But again, we need to bear in mind what cells do we really need to replace and what cells could we actually retrieve uh, and again, a very exciting area of research, but there is a literature, there are lots of publications, and uh, I guess that if this particular individual is very interested, if she writes in to Tina, then we will facilitate you with some of the technical references. Thank you very much, John. I think we've got time for one more, and there's a lady in, um, if one of my colleagues could bring a microphone here, because this lady's been waiting very patiently all along. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in uh, Dr. Shah's very clear and comprehensive talk, he mentioned one of the side effects of research being progression in other areas of knowledge. And um, for example, retinal imaging. And so this is a question about imaging and investigations. At the moment, those of us with degenerative retinal diseases tend to um, go along, have our imaging, our investigations in a serial manner. And we're told, well, from an objective point of view, this is how much things have changed over the last year, for example. And I want to ask the panel if you envisage in the future a situation where the imaging, the investigations we have, may be looking at uh, metabolism or phagocytosis, um, can actually tell us, actually, this is what we predict to change for you, objectively speaking, within the next three months, six months, if that makes sense. Mittal. So I think that's the long-term goal. Um, I think going down to that sort of cellular level of imaging you were talking about, um, so I showed that photo towards the end of an image uh, from an adaptive optic scanning laser ophthalmoscope. So that's the one where it actually allows you to see individual cells in the living eye. Um, so that's something that is essentially taking some technology that's used in astronomy to look at stars and applying it to retinal imaging. And that's the highest resolution at the moment anyway that we're able to get. Um, and on that image, you're able to see the cone uh, photoreceptors. So these are the, the, the ones that are mainly in the central retina. And labs around the world that are working on it are now able to improve, improve that resolution to see the rod photoreceptors, uh, the ones that are more in the peripheral vision. But not quite yet at seeing anything more than that. And bear in mind that these cells are, are small, very, very small. So we're talking two microns. Um, and so that's kind of where we are with that, but it's not at a state where you're going to, for example, see it in your routine clinic when you go to see your ophthalmologist next. It's still very much more, I think, a research instrument at the moment. Um, but you're right, I, mean, I think the, ultimately the idea is if we're able to use these new technologies and even existing technologies to 
image patients over time. So it goes back to that natural history, um, look at using observational data, and then from that data, trying to predict, okay, what are the features actually that are telling us that there are signs of pro progression? Um, so we can then use that at, at a new visit to say, oh, look, we've seen feature X, Y, and Z, and that tells us based on the information we have that you may be progressing in the next one year, two years, and things like that. And also it may be useful for future trials as well. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, we're, we're, we're using imaging, we're using functional measures over time, uh, which means that sometimes these trials need to be long for us to say, is this treatment actually going to work or not? Um, and that sort of prolonged period of the trial is, is adding to the cost. And if we're actually able to say quite convincingly, this imaging feature alone is enough to tell us quite accurately that um, we're preserving the vision or you're going to get vision back here, then potentially in the future, that may mean that trials can be shorter, potentially cheaper as well. Thank you very much. I think um, we have run out of time. So um, thank you all very much for your uh, questions, but thank you especially to our panel and um, John, who we can't see at the moment, um, for um, taking those questions. Um, Matt, do you have a... Yes, thank you ever so much for everyone who joined us on the panel. So now it's time for your first break. Um, so please do go around, see the exhibitors, get yourself a coffee, a bit of cake, tea, um, and we will resume back in here at five past 12 for our second session. Thank you very much.